Hey everybody, this is Mike with On Point Preparedness. I hope you're all doing well. I got a good one for you today. This one is courtesy of a sister in Christ named Marie, who sent me an article, um, a historical uh, essay, if you will, that we are going to review regarding Christian persecution that happened during the Revolutionary War. And it was actually fellow Christian patriots that were fighting against the Britons that actually persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, had actually sentenced some to death, had starved some, pretty crazy stuff. This is history that I was not aware of, and this article is very well researched. If you look in the YouTube description box, you can find the link to this article uh, it's actually really nice because the entire thing is only 15 pages long. So this is definitely a read that we all can do. And I highly suggest you know, after this broadcast, you, you do read it. So this is in line with a lot of what I've been showcasing on this channel for the past two and a half years, uh, particularly... I'll just switch on over here to the screen share, and we've been seeing a lot of this. This is on t-shirts. Uh, there's very popular YouTubers uh, like Apologia that have, um, I think, made reference to this. Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. And we've seen this in a lot of reform camps and also non-reform. You see this in a lot of different segments of Christianity. Um, ones that are completely polar opposite uh, from each other in terms of their beliefs and doctrines. Uh, you know, you have this same type of mentality in people in the NAR. Uh, you've, you've got some, some wild characters out there that are saying this. But again, it's all about how look, they want you to look at all the blatant evils that are happening, happening from the left. These are definitely very blatant evils. It's not even hidden. I almost think that the devil is trolling Christians by just making it so apparent. And they're saying, look at this evil. You need to stand on the conservative right. You need to stand on the side of righteousness. And they're trying to paint this very black and white picture of the left is evil, which it is. So come on over to the side of righteousness. But the side of righteousness, quote unquote, is just filled with people of the world, new agers, um, lots, lots and lots of false doctrine. I've done videos on this about how this thought process is really Herodian leaven. A lot of these people on the conservative right are almost using the Bible and, and using this situation to encourage people and say that God is on our side. God is on the conservative right side. He wants us to take dominion back over uh, a lot of these terrible things that are happening. And it sounds like a good message. However, it is incredibly deceptive because it is yoking people back up with the world. It's yoking Christians uh, along with those that have false doctrines, false gospels. And the thing that I want to make mention today is that this is not something that's foreign to temptations that have happened to man. Uh, in fact, let me um, let me bring up some scripture here, because I think this is a good one. First um, Corinthians chapter ten says, "No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man." And you'll see, with regards to this Herodian leaven, with regards to the devil using patriotism or love of country, and the tyranny that is taking that away from you, the devil has multiple times used this to stir up zeal in people, both the Jews and Christians, to serve country over God and make them think that by serving their country and, and fighting for their country, they are in fact serving God. Just like that quote we saw from John Knox. Yeah, this is making it believe that if you resist tyrants, then you're being obedient to God. Now, of course, there's situations like... Um, um, Daniel in the lion's den, and there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Obviously, if 
there are quote unquote tyrants or people that are trying to make you deny your faith, deny God, well then we resist. But that's not what is being talked about here. Uh, we, we all know the types of things that people were being encouraged to do against government uh, that really had nothing to do with the faith itself. So again, this has happened multiple times throughout history and we're going to lightly touch on what happened in 70 AD. I already did a video on this. I'm going to just touch briefly on one aspect of it uh, as I go through this show. Uh, the video is entitled, I'm Not a Preterist But. So I think 70 AD is very much a typology of what might be coming in the future. And obviously we're going to be looking at this article today about the Revolutionary War. And hopefully you will see some very stunning parallels with what is actively happening today. Uh, very, very deep deception that is captivating many within Christianity. So this is from Liberty University. Um, one second here, let me just get everything straight here and actually maybe I will, let me just move, move me off the screen here just so you guys can see everything. Again, this is only about 15 pages long. I recommend you read it afterwards but I just have a couple highlighted sections that we're going to go through. We'll probably be here for about 30 minutes, so not in a terribly long video. Now, just looking at the summary here, now this is titled Radicals in the Revolution, the Persecution of Christians During the Revolutionary War. Um, it's going to talk specifically about the history of Pennsylvania, which boasted religious freedoms. And it's going to look at some denominations of Christianity that were were persecuted for their religious beliefs. Now, I haven't looked deeply into Quakers and Anabaptists. I personally don't subscribe to you know a particular denomination. Uh, I'm sure if we looked into the Quakers and the Anabaptists in, in terms of some of their beliefs, you know, there's probably some things that are off, but. In terms of what they were standing for here and what was written in the article, they were not wrong. They were following their convictions of faith and were persecuted violently for it uh, to not go along with the revolution and, and to shed blood. So it says that both Quakers and Anabaptists adhered to the most conservative interpretation of Jesus' teachings on not resisting an evil person and the swearing of oaths. When Protestant revolutionaries took over the Pennsylvania gov government during the war, they required all residents of Pennsylvania to take an oath of allegiance to the colony, the Quakers and the Anabaptists, because of their conscientious objection to the war and to swearing of oaths, refused to do so. The revolutionaries, as a result, treated them as if they were the worst of traitors. The irony, however, is that religious freedom was one of the causes for which they fought. Now, I hope you can actually see that same thing happening today. I've been persecuted just for some of the messaging that I've had. You know, if you if you go against, I mean, there, there's various different levels of it, but if you go against Trump, some people will automatically say, well, you're a Hillary-loving uh pro baby killer, you know, just, just instantly type of reviling. That's obviously the most extreme of it, but you know, there, there's others, um, that will, will more subtly just think that you're a leftist and they just can't believe like, how, how can you not be on this side? Look, look at what the left is doing. How, how can you not fight against this? And again, we have to you know, really subscribe to the teachings of Jesus and look at the Bible. And it, it you know, we are not called to um, fight for political domain. So, I also want to highlight the fact here that um, check this out. The um, let's see here. Well, I'll, I'll get to it later. I want to tie this in to 70 A.D. here, but we'll we'll wait till we get to a couple more passages in this article. So, in the introduction says, when the Revolutionary War broke out in 1776, many Americans were ready to stand up and fight for their freedoms. After all, they had been resisting British taxation and enforcement thereof for more than a decade, but not all Americans necessarily supported the revolution, 
even if they were against the new taxes, let alone the notion of war in order to solve their problems. In fact, there were some groups of devout Christians who would rather die than take the sword. In particular, among these were the Quakers and those known as the Anabaptists, Amish, Mennonites, Brethren, etc. These Christians went against the grain of the dominant thinking patterns of their day. Moreover, they paid a high price for it. In the process of refusing to resist evil, these peace-loving Christians were met with severe persecution from their patriotic neighbors. In the process of defending what they believed were their freedoms by divine right, the colonists, in their treatment of these Christians, tyrannically deprived their peaceful neighbors of some of those necessary freedoms in order to gain their own. Wow. Let's read on. Uh, this just a little bit of highlight here. It talks about how you know a lot of these different Anabaptists and the Quakers had some differences in beliefs and doctrines, but they were still relatively civil. The thing that united them with regards to this persecution was again they did not want to shed blood. Uh, they didn't want to you know return evil for evil. And they also didn't want to take oaths. Uh, particularly, this also mentions the fact that the Revolutionary War was about taxes. And if we remember the verses here in the uh, various synoptic gospels, you know, it re references uh, passages like Mark 12, 17. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. Um, so again, in relation to the taxes, a lot of these people were saying, you know, Jesus says, you know, just give them what they think is due, even if it's unfair. But again, these were the two things that united them in this persecution against them, was particularly the fact that they didn't want to revolt, they didn't want to rebel and shed blood, and they didn't want to take these, these oaths. And the oath is very interesting. We'll get to that here in a second. Now, talking about the revolution actually coming to Pennsylvania and what happened to these Christians. So it reads, protests against the taxes often took on a violent shape. As time progressed, no resolution seemed to be in sight. As one attempted to navigate the spiritual waters of colonial soil, even Protestant churches were almost unanimously in favor of revolution. One Congregationalist minister opposed the conflict and his congregation forced him to resign. While Jesus said in response to Pharisees who had posed the question of whether or not the Romans had any right to tax the Jews, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. However, as Burcott, this is one of the references that this author notates below in the footer, as Burcott notes, the clergy not only failed to deter the colonists in their rebellion, they actually egged them on. They encouraged it. Burcott goes on to detail all the ways in which ministers who were in favor of the revolution used... This is so important, guys. He goes on to detail all the ways in which ministers who were in favor of the revolution used the Bible to help justify the American Revolution. They frequently used scripture as a means to convince their fellow colonists that the revolution had God's blessing. Don't we hear that today still? And he, was, and he God, was clearly on the side of the revolutionaries. So, the churches in effect became places of political stirring toward and mustering troops for rebellion against England, which took on a more fierce shape as it continued to grow larger. Now, remember this, because I'm going to show you some quotes from Josephus in 70 AD where the Jews revolted against the Romans. Okay, These ministers who were in favor of the revolution used the Bible to help justify the American Revolution and that God had blessed the revolutionaries, and he was on their side. Let's look at what Josephus wrote in 70 AD. I know this is a little bit hard for you guys to read, but uh, I'll just read it here. Yet there was one Judas, a Golanite of a city whose name was Gamala, um, 
who, taking with him Saduk, a Pharisee, became zealous to draw them, the Jews, to a revolt, who both said that this taxation was no better than an introduction to slavery and exhorted the nation to assert their liberty as if they could procure them happiness and security for what they possessed. And an assured enjoyment of uh, a still greater good, which was that of the honor and glory they would thereby acquire for magnanimity. They also said that God would not otherwise be assisting to them than upon their joining with one another in such councils as might be successful and for their own advantage, and this especially if they would set about great exploits and not grow weary in executing the same. Um, so, yeah, basically it just goes on to, it, it ruined, that mentality ruined them. Essentially, there was a fourth sect of the Jews, a political sect, partially led by this individual named Judas. And he said, just as what we read in the Revolutionary War, he told the Jews that the Romans taxing the Jews was no better than slavery, that they need to assert their liberty, and that God would not be with them unless they would join in with this revolution. That is exactly what we see written regarding ministers, Protestant ministers, during the Revolutionary War. It is the exact same thing that we are seeing today with the replication of resistance to tyranny is obedience to God and, and, and you know getting yoked up with all these other people of the world that we really shouldn't be yoked up with. But it gets more interesting, folks. It gets way more interesting as you start to read through this article, and you'll see why I want you to all personally read this afterwards because there's, there's a lot of good stuff in here which I just can't do for brevity of time. While political squabbles between the non-resistant Quakers and Protestants who did not oppose war raged over the years prior to the American Revolution, each side maintained its particular religious beliefs even if no compromise between the two sides was reached. Even if they did not agree with each other, they maintained enough civility not to go to war prior to the American Revolution. So it just talks about differences um, and you know they, they still maintain civility. However, with the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, a political shift occurred in the government of Pennsylvania. A new revolutionary government composed of various types of Protestants rapidly took over Pennsylvania and established a host of new wartime laws which put all of the conscientious objectors into a very trying position. It would be a fiery test for all of their dearly held religious convictions. What do you think is happening right now? Not just within the United States, but globally. If you see like um, what's happening in Italy, you know, sweeping uh, victory for the conservative right, and you know, it's all about God and country and and taking out the elites and stopping the NWO and the Great Reset. There's a lot of people out there that are coming into positions of power which say they are Christian, yet they're coming out with this very revolutionary type mindset. Same thing that happened during the Revolutionary War. And again, that this, with these new types of Christian leaders, these Protestant leaders, it would be a fiery test um, for their religious convictions that they read about in Scripture. Those wartime laws that were established required those loyal to George III to comprise uh, compromise that loyalty, among other things, was a conscription which carried with it a heavy fine for refusing to enlist. In addition, the revolutionary government required an oath of allegiance from all residents of Pennsylvania. And so basically, I'm not going to read this, but it says that you need to renounce um, King George and you need to renounce Great Britain and you need to swear your allegiance to the state, which means even, you know, going to war, fighting. Again, this was against the religious conviction of many of these people who did not want to swear an oath because Scripture says, do not swear an oath either, either on by heaven or by earth. Just let your yes be yes and your no by no be no. So they were against the oath and they were against fighting. And so you can see when they 
when the revolutionary government came out with these um, these uh, conscriptions and these oaths that you had to affirm, uh, it, it was a trying test for some of these Christians. It went directly against the religious convictions of the Quakers and Anabaptists who believed firmly that Jesus had forbade any and all swearing of oaths as noted above, even if there was a provision in the oath to allow for affirmation rather than swearing, these people had more than just opposition to oath swearing to stand behind um, when refusing to take this oath. So again, they were in a trying position. But here is the here is the crazy part. Um, if you did not take this oath to the revolutionary government and to the state, if you didn't pledge your allegiance to them, those not taking the oath were declared incapable of serving on juries, suing for debts, voting or holding office, buying or selling land, uh, tenements or hereditaments, uh, and possessing arms. Everyone traveling outside his own city or country without having taken the oath was to be clapped in jail till he took it. So our government, the you know, the Revolutionary War, fighting for freedom, Declaration of Independence, all this stuff that we hear about all the time now from conservative patriots. It was that revolutionary government that had absolutely no problem taking lots of so-called rights away from Christians who did not affirm to fighting in the war and, and were holding to their religious convictions. Um, the revolutionaries who earlier claimed that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were the freedoms that they fought for were more than willing to take these freedoms away from those who refused to declare their utmost allegiance. But in addition to the principles on which the Anabaptists firmly stood, they were also unwilling to take the oath because of how closely it resembled the mark of the beast, as described in the book of Revelation. I find that quite interesting. Uh, they were not only unwilling to compromise about Jesus' teachings, but they also did not want to seemingly sell their souls. The oath seemed to contradict everything they stood for. Now, if something like that happened again, do I think that's the mark of the beast? No, I'm not saying that, but again, this is just fairly interesting in terms of what they stood for back then. Going on, a new look at colonial patriotism and the fight for freedom. Said, Yet, how is what the revolutionaries did to the Anabaptists and Quakers different from that accusation? Is it not tyrannical to take away someone's basic rights in the name of defending freedom? Most people today would give a unanimous yes answer to that question. However, the revolutionaries had a limited concept of application of this principle. They had an agenda, and those who failed to comply were regarded as mortal enemies to the cause, despite never having taken uh, taken up arms against anyone, friend or foe. So again, these were peaceful Christians. They, you know, they didn't support. They weren't loyalists to the King of England. Um, they weren't taking up arms against the revolutionaries. They just were like, "Let us live in peace. We don't want to be a part of it." Yet, they were treated as mortal enemies. Again, we looked at some of the things that happened to them. But I think later in this article, it says that even um, some were sentenced to death. Uh, some were starved out in their cells. Because uh, you, know, it said, um, uh, where was it? It said here that, yeah, some were put into jail, and they they were jailed in te until they took that oath. Those are pretty serious things that are happening to these Christians. Going on, loyalty to country above all else. This, however, should not be a surprise, as noted earlier. The clergy were already keeping the fires of revolution burning among the typical Protestant flock. One in particular, an Anglican parson named John Hurt, proclaimed on one hand that Americans would never accept British tyranny, while the cause of religion, the cause of nature, and of nature's God cry aloud. On the other hand, Hurt told the troops that the love of your country should be the governing principle of your soul. Jesus clearly stated that no man can serve two masters. Here, Hurt exhorts the troops to make their patriotism their first duty, even apart from loving God, as Thomas Kidd notes. 
All that mattered to most people was breaking off from Great Britain by any means. Thus, while patriotic clergymen exhorted the colonial armies to have their patriotism as their chief loyalty, this meant they had to crush all loyalist opposition, which unfortunately included you know, these, these peaceful Christians that were sort of in the middle. And, and we, we see this so much today, too. You know, People say, I serve God first, then country. But actions speak louder than words. You know, all all we're hearing is country, 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 and the Great Commission is is really not heard as much from from these same folks that are proclaiming the tyranny of the leftism and how we need to take it down. It goes on as their neighbors who shared similar hesitations to them, the Quakers and Anabaptists soon found themselves the latest targets of the American Revolution. Refusing to sign the oath, as noted earlier, may as well have said that death would be the sentence. John L. Ruth notes that some people were executed for their stance, and this in spite of the fact that numerous residents appealed to their fellow Christians running the government to consider the implications of such actions. There were Christ, there were people that bore the name of brother and sister in Christ. They bore the name of Christian that were running the government that executed fellow Christians that weren't willing to take up arms and weren't really willing to take an oath. And there were other brothers and sisters in Christ which implored those Christians running the government to not do so, but they did anyways. Now, I don't know to what degree they sentenced people to death, Hopefully it wasn't large amounts, but but still, but still, we we see that this is a part of history regarding the American Revolution that we really, we really don't hear about, and we see we see this uh, the potential for this growing every day with with the things that were faced in Pennsylvania. The press had an anti-war voice in the form of Christopher Sauer II, a brother and bishop and printer, who was the son of a printer of the same name. Leroy Beachy details what happened to Sawyer as a result of his stance against the Revolutionary War and subsequent refusal to take the oath. Already, the Revolutionary government was on the hunt for possible loyalists in Pennsylvania. Sauer's anti-war preaching brought him the attention of the revolutionary government. When he refused to take the oath, the prisoner suffered indignities, among them the removal of his remarkable and full-grown beard. On another occasion, American soldiers stripped him of his clothes, then redressed him in tattered army uniforms. So again, just personal accounts of you know the, the persecution that they faced for standing up for their religious convictions. Other innocent Christians also lost their property, were thrown into prison, or even made exiles. In some of these noteworthy cases, little to no care was shown to those who would suffer starvation as a result of government confiscation of property. From some of them, all of the provisions were taken and not even a morsel of bread left uh, them for their children. Since all their iron stoves were taken from them, though fastened to the floors, they are deprived of every means of keeping their children warm in the approaching winter, especially at nights, being obliged to sleep on the floor without any beds. I mean, wow. Wow. And, and yet they say, you know, God was on the side of the revolutionaries. Now, of course, you know, the revolutionaries, they won. But just because God... God allows something to end up in your favor does not necessarily mean that God has done it because he agrees with it. <laughs> there's there's a lot of evidence in the Bible where you know God God gives man his heart's desire. And and of course there's been lots of blessings that have that have happened as well. Right? So I mean the, the freedom that has happened in, in America, you know, we've obviously allowed Christianity to um, spread throughout the world through missions and things like that. However, if you look at the principle of the revolution, re, revolutionary war 
and it was you know primarily in regards to taxes among other things i mean scripture says render to caesar what is caesar's that that shouldn't have been a reason to shed blood and again we we are not to shed blood and and we just we see the persecution uh happen because of those religious convictions and uh, just serious consequences that happen to uh, those people and their families. So uh, I'm going to end here. Uh, we are right at about 30 minutes. I'm going to end here just with uh, this person's reflections. So this uh, this person who wrote this, this was back in 2016. So again, this this largely avoided a lot of the, the political polarization uh, of the past couple of years. But uh, they have some reflections. It, it appears to me that this person um, says that they're also a Christian. He says, this research has a lot of significance to the Christian faith in general in America. Today, most conservative Christians are firmly devoted to both God and country. However, Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God. Consequently, when Satan told Jesus that he controlled all the kingdoms of the world, that included every nation. Even the United States of America, which has allowed Christians more freedoms than most nations, is not completely innocent of persecuting Christians. Since the American Revolution is part of history that most are familiar with, it shows Christians an example of what happens when one's country comes first. After all, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Consequently, this topic is relevant to the church because it is a further reminder that as Christians, we are citizens of a different kingdom. While we can certainly appreciate the freedoms God has provided for us in America, it is simultaneously only temporary, and we should not be surprised when persecution does come. When a critical issue such as the American Revolution does strike, how we respond will determine which master we have ultimately chosen, whether God or country. This challenges me much in my faith because persecution is a notion so foreign to most of us here in America that the events that the heroes of the Revolutionary War partook in was shocking at first. It shook any preconceived notions I had on the issue and taught me not to believe everything I hear, but to do research and to see for myself how things actually were in a given time period by researching primary sources and secondary sources that were being honest with the primary source material, which you will find at the end of this article. Conclusion, the treatment of non-resistant Christians during the Revolutionary War sheds a dark light on American history from its beginning. America continued to follow similar patterns to those of the revolution when dealing with religious conscientious objectors. It makes one wonder which direction America will go in the future as the world gets darker and darker. Essentially, in this article, when I skip past it, they talk about how the same type of religious persecution essentially happened with every large war that happened in the United States, including the Civil War, where Abraham Lincoln uh, also persecuted Christians who uh, would not fight for the cause. Uh, so again, there's, uh, I don't think I have any more highlights here, but you know, very well researched uh, with lots of historical documentation that you can find in this article. But I, again, I want to bring this back to you know, this verse that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And for, for further watch watching, <laughs> for, for further information, if you have not seen this yet, uh, it's been a while, but I have this video called I'm Not a Preterist, but I believe I have this linked in the YouTube description box. Here you can find all the words from historian Josephus regarding the great revolt of the Jews in 70 AD. And I'll also detail in this video how I think this is very much a typology of what's to come. This ties in with the seven, um, this ties in with these uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 video that I did with regards to the restrainer. Um, but also, there's a lot of things I haven't covered about the United States that people may not be aware of. The fact that, you know, a lot of people you hear continually that we're a Christian country, our, our roots and our founding fathers were Christian, and the Revolutionary War was a good thing. We fought for our freedoms. They're heroes. They were for God and country. Well, we already looked at the dark truths behind the revolution just with that short article. Um, but in this video, Do Not Weep for Rome, I go into the fact that, no, there, there was a lot of the founders who were Freemasons. Um, some of them were just, just believed in just the deity of God and, and were not really Christian at all. 
Uh, there's just lots of disturbing trends in terms of how the United States is essentially a re-embodiment of Rome. So again, in this video, do not read for Rome. I, I detail um, a lot of these, a lot of these different things. And uh, yeah, you know, when you're really aware of the history of the United States, again, we're not to hate our country. We're not to hate our leaders. We're to pray for our leaders. But we have to be realistic when it comes to all these voices preaching, saying, you know resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. You need to be on the right side of history. The faithful in Jesus Christ need to stand up for this cause. This is the same thing that happened in 70 AD. This is the same thing that happened during the Revolutionary War. And honestly, to me, it's happening again, and it's going to be on a far grander scale than perhaps the world has ever seen. Again, if you if you tie this all in to the Second Thessalonians chapter two restrainer video um, that I have on my channel, so with that, you know we are a little bit past thirty minutes here, and I do want to keep this relatively short. Again, the link to that article is in the YouTube description box, and I I hope and I and I pray you you see the the whew, it's just absolutely stunning similarities between 70 AD and and what some of these Jewish this Jewish sect this political Jewish sect was telling the Jews in order to get them to revolt God is with you God will bless you um, assert your liberty taxation is slavery <laughs> and the Revolutionary War is the same thing Protestant ministers saying God is for this revolution. You are on the side of God if you fight against the British. And then today, today, what do we, we hear again? It's the NWO. It's the Great Reset. It's the leftists. They are, you know, printing all this money. They're taking away your wealth. They're taxing us into oblivion. They're, they're taking away all the sources of food. They're taking away all the sources of fuel and energy. They want to enslave you. They want you to eat bugs. They all this all this stuff. I mean, I'm aware of all of it. It is cultivating rebellion. And the unfortunate thing is you're hearing this more and more from Christian sources. And um, it's you know, a lot of these Christians who say these things are like, oh, but but you know, it has to be nonviolent. It has to be nonviolent. But the reality of it is just as that one person said Burkott in one of those prime, uh, secondary research articles, he said that the Protestant ministers were sort of egging it on. So even though you're not calling for violence, you're fueling an anger in the population by talking about the enslavement that people are under to where it makes them want to be violent. So you may not be actively, you know, some of these Christians today may not be actively saying, pick up your gun and, you know, Let's do something about it. But you keep on day in and day out. Drive it into the subconscious of people about how the elite want to enslave you and your children. And it will cause an emotional response related to rebellion and revolt. And as we see with human psychology, all you need is a certain volume or certain amount of people that cross that threshold into talk uh, from talk into action and then a lot of people follow and again i that's why you know i when i'm talking about everything that's going on in the world i try to just say factually about you know here's all the things that are happening be prepared but i'm i'm very conscious about not trying to stir up anger in people because there's way too much of this that goes on, even amongst Christians. You don't want to provoke people. That's the word that I was looking for. Do not provoke people to a rebellious spirit. Because that's on you. That's on you. God, you know, is looking at us and how we're conducting ourselves and, and, and what we're sowing out into the world. And we do not want to be seeding provoking language into a world that is already, you know, bent on revolt. And it's coming, and nothing's stopping it, but we don't want to be part of that problem. So I uh, hope you all enjoyed this. 
uh, with that, I'm going to close this live stream. Thank you all for tuning in. Hope this blessed you. Uh, I typically don't really get into history, but I think this was a really good one. Thank you, Marie, for sharing this with me. And uh, hopefully, maybe tomorrow or the next day, I'm going to do a video showing lots of shocking signs of revolt out of Iran and various other countries. So uh, stay tuned for that one. This is Mike with On Point Preparedness. God bless.